If you're sick of being you, be someone else for a while. <laughs> yeah, and just where, where do you suppose that I do that? Hey, Ms. Mojo fans, have we got a scoop for you. Spotted. Poor little rich boy. Once the biggest catch on the Upper East Side, these days it seems like no one even remembers N is around. Until they need his help, anyway. How did the consummate insider find himself out in the cold? Compared to the rest of his social circle, it just doesn't feel like just desserts. But maybe we serve up the sweet spoonful of vindication. Nate Archibald, this one's for you. XOXO, Miss Mojo. Thanks, man. I mean, this could change my life. The character you know. In terms of impact on a story, you might say that Nate Archibald started out as the most important character in Gossip Girl. In love with Golden Girl Serena Vanderwoodson since childhood, but perpetually coupled up with her best friend Blair Waldorf instead, Nate was the cornerstone of the story's foundational love triangle. When he and Serena shared a booze-soaked hookup prior to season one, it caused her to leave New York for boarding school without a word to anyone, fracturing their friend group and setting the stage for her dramatic return a year later. There, it's Serena. Serena? <laughs> Serena's at school. Kiss me. No, I just heard your mom say she's here. Okay, yes, there was a brief and bizarre subplot about an overdose and a guilty conscience being the real motivation for Serena's disappearance. Regardless, the romantic tension of the Nate-Serena-Blair triangle played a huge part in shaping the plot and character dynamics of the first season. Look, Blair, I'm really trying to make an effort here. I thought everything was good between us. It was, before I found out you had sex with my boyfriend. This was also the through line that kept Nate looped into the story. Because the truth is, Nate always had way more on his plate than whatever high school soap opera his friends were embroiled in. I saw your father get arrested. Why didn't you come to me? I would have listened. I've tried, Blair. But every time I try, something's got your attention. A dinner party, you know, a mass ball. As the son of a Vanderbilt socialite and a powerful banker, handsome, athletic Nate grew up as a Park Avenue prince. However, the older he got, the more his privileged existence started to close in on him. You know, only entitled to choose, just to be happy. Look easy, Socrates. What we're entitled to is a trust fund, maybe a house in the Hamptons, a prescription drug problem. But happiness does not seem to be on the menu. Pressured by his parents to choose the approved college and date the approved girl, Nate was already struggling with feeling as though he had no control over his life. And then his entire world spirals out of control when his father's misdeeds come to light. I'm guilty, Nate. I'm facing 25 years. That's all this stuff about things looking good and working out, huh? Financially ruined, his parents flee the country, and Nate is left on his own to piece his life back together, often with the interference of his Vanderbilt grandfather. No matter what he was going through, though, Nate remained the most decent person in his peer group. Forgiving to a fault, he was always the first to step up and try to help a friend, or even frenemy, in need, while mostly managing to keep his own reputation out of the mud. You're such a good guy, Nate Archibald. Can I kiss you before I kill you? Of all the main characters on the show, Nate is the only one that never sent a tip to Gossip Girl, and rarely did he find himself spotlighted by the infamous blogger. Maybe that's a sign that we're supposed to consider him boring? But honestly, it just makes Nate one of the only people on the show we'd actually want to hang out with. I judged the cover, but now that I've read the book, I figured you were owed some apologetic subaki at the very least. Where it went wrong. Unfortunately, Nate belongs to a club of fictional characters who are defined by their love lives. And even more unfortunately, it was a hard trap to slip because from his genesis in the mind of novelist Cecily Von Zegazer, a love triangle was the entire basis for Nate's character. Does this have anything to do with why you're waiting for Serena this morning? You were what? Here I thought you were waiting for me. Oh, exactly what the situation needs. Chuck, now what is going on? The first season of the show translates this element faithfully. We're introduced to a Nate torn between his unrequited feelings for Serena and his relationship with Blair. However, the series started to peel away from the book plot lines pretty quickly. And where Nate was the ultimate love interest of both girls on the page, things rapidly shifted on TV. I'm just gonna step out for a while. Nate's gonna wait for Serena. Great. He can get in line behind that guy. Dan Humphrey was elevated from a brief fling to a primary love interest for Serena. Meanwhile, the chemistry between Leighton Meester and Ed Westwick morphed Blair and Chuck's friendship of convenience into the marquee love story of the entire series. The flagship, if you will. It's funny. <laughs> so, you guys want to sit together at lunch? 
these changes left Nate adrift. Not only was he without an obvious partner in a show where the relationship drama was a huge piece of the individual arcs, but he was now completely detached from his original narrative purpose. Easy come, easy go. The upshot is that Nate would go on to appear in the fewest number of episodes of any main cast member, and that he frequently felt like an afterthought tacked on in whatever way was the most useful for the plot lines of his friends. Nate's own story beats centered almost entirely on his dating escapades, with an array of short-lived relationships most notable for the fact that he was frequently paired with ladies who were introduced as antagonists to Blair or Serena. Don't even get us started on the show's disturbing habit of putting him in manipulative situations with older women. When the best version of the situation is that I'm gonna become Blair's father-in-law, I think it's just time to move on, Catherine. Occasionally, Nate got to be more than convenient arm candy. In a few arcs that felt like they came from another series entirely, his Vanderbilt relatives would get him swept up in their political aspirations, often ending with a disenchanted Nate taking a step back for a while. I discovered he was the one who had my father investigated by the authorities. And if he cares so much about family, then why did he destroy mine? In the later seasons, he took over running the publication The Spectator, which should have been a chance to let the character evolve. However, it soon became just another set piece to service the needs of the other plots. We were very excited about Dan Humphrey's inaugural serial. We knew it would draw a lot of eyeballs. And it has. And I know Dan's piece next week will garner even more attention. By series end, we're led to believe Nate has become a media mogul of some kind. It's also hinted that he's finally ready to bow to his grandfather's wishes and jump into politics. He'll be the youngest mayor ever in the history of the city. Only if I win. And I haven't even said if I'm running. Polls already have you out in front. Considering that one of Nate's most defining traits across the series was his desire to make his own path, it feels like a cop-out. Maybe even more so because it was one of the few definitions the writing ever let him have. Where do you think you're going? Home. I don't think so. Now you get back out there and you finish what you started. I mean, what you started? How we fix it. Nate is Gossip Girl. You have got to be kidding me. No, pitchforks away, please. We're kidding. He was one of the characters once considered for the job, though. And it certainly would be interesting. Seeing Nate turn out to be the Upper East Side's omnipresent mean girl in chief would be quite the switch up. But while a part of us is drawn to that chaos, ultimately we can't stand to lose one of the few good ones the show gave us. I understand you uh, recently went to jail yourself, Mr. Archibald. Hate to see you back there. So for real this time, how do we fix it? As someone trying to make their own way, maybe it makes sense that Nate is the only character on the show reliably in possession of a compass. A moral compass, that is. I can't believe you told her! You just expected me to keep it a secret. Yes, Nate! There's nothing wrong with keeping a secret if the truth is gonna hurt someone! That's a hell of a way to look at things. As much as he obviously cares for his friends and family, he has always stood a bit apart from them. Not blinded by ambition, and only rarely swept up in his emotions, more than anyone around him, Nate can be counted on to do the right thing. His priority seems to be finding the truth in any situation, regardless of the agendas at play. That's pretty exhausting, though. Hey, don't, don't get me started on exhausted. Hey, what you're really tired of is keeping everything a big secret. Maybe that's why Nate is Gossip Girl's go-to man whenever sleuthing becomes necessary. With the number of investigations he was involved in over the seasons, we're shocked that the CW never took Kristen Bell out of the narrator's corner and put her on screen for a Veronica Mars crossover special. Come on, you were always on that thing. This audition's really important to me. Plus, the book is a bestseller and it has a built-in movie audience. With that in mind, we think that season four is the perfect place to start tweaking Nate's storyline. When he was dumped by Serena at the end of the previous season, it severed his last remaining link to his original book persona. So it's an organic place to try something different. Oh, so I didn't realize you and Serena were actually over. Yeah, well, I'm not gonna spend the entire summer waiting for her to figure things out. Right, yeah, that, uh, that makes sense. Season four already brought several new elements into play. When Howard Archibald is paroled from prison, he moves in with Nate, and the steps he takes to restart his financial career brought Russell Thorpe into the story. Forget your usual suspects, Upper East Siders. I look forward to facing you all. There's a new family in town. Russell, who has a long and bitter history with the late Bart Bass, comes to New York intent on destroying Bass Industries. Nate becomes a key player in all the drama that follows, not only because of the implications for his best friend Chuck and for Howard, but also as a result of a connection he sparks with Russell's daughter, Raina. When I go catch the game highlights somewhere, I just need to not talk about this for a while. 
Yeah. That'd be great. Disappointingly, the Thorpe storyline eventually boils down to a dead-end tangent with little impact on any longer plot lines. It could be more, though. Smarter than you look, Archibald. I get that a lot. Nate has his suspicions about Howard's new job at Thorpe Enterprises from the start, but mostly because of all the complications of the situation. Chuck is family. I would never do anything to jeopardize things for him. You do realize that's a total contradiction, though, being Chuck's family and then working for the Thorpes. <laughs> Word around the office is that he's banging Thorpe's daughter. Talk about sleeping with the enemy. But that's Chuck's decision, okay? And whatever happens with Raina is on him and him alone. You need the second chance. Sure, there's plenty of reason for Nate to be concerned, but what if he found something that raised a red flag in a more tangible sense? Like, for example, if he accidentally stumbled upon something in the family banking that didn't add up? Hey, Tom, thanks for getting back to me so quickly. Your message said it was important. Um, yeah, I was, I was checking my accounts and I came across what I assumed to be an error. The Archibalds never technically lost their position in society, but Howard's antics severely handicapped their net worth. Yet suddenly, their debts are paid and their accounts are flush all as a result of transfers from a mysterious offshore source. My worry, mysterious financial transactions, warring parents, welcome to the Upper East Side. Chuck's game with Russell can continue to unfold pretty much the way it already does on the show, but now, in addition to helping his friend, Nate will also be trying to figure out his father's motives. And when Howard turns company intel over to Chuck that will rule out Russell as a factor in the Archibald family's windfall. This is to Thorpe's office. And this, all the passwords you need. As Chuck, Nate, and Raina close in on the increasingly unhinged Russell, Nate's investigation will yield the revelation that those offshore payments were being approved by a small financial firm in New York, a tiny subsidiary of Bass Industries. When the Thorpe arc comes to its resolution, the trio make their way to the office for answers, only to discover a ghost from the past awaiting them. Oh my God. Yes, bonkers as it is, we're going to keep the resurrection of Chuck's Machiavellian father, Bart Bass. We will learn that not only did he settle the Archibald family's financial matters, but he pulled strings to arrange Howard's parole, all in order to enlist him as a pawn against Russell. We thought they might be using you just to get information. I'm a grown man, Nate. And I'm actually good at what I do. It's not merely because of the long-standing feud, or because of Russell's intentions against Bass Industries, but because Russell's ambitions have seen him approaching lucrative opportunities with some dubious partners, potentially threatening Bart Bass's interests on a deeper level. Put a pin in that, we'll circle back. What is this? You're kicking me out? After years under the thumb of Gossip Girl, Nate's tolerance for secrets and shadow networks is already pretty low. While confiding in Reyna, he expresses his frustration that everything in his life seems to lead back to a scheme or plot. She challenges him to do something about it. What would you be doing if I wasn't here? Probably just studying. What subjects? Pointing out that turbulence in the media industry, Reyna will suggest acquiring a failing magazine or paper and using it as a means to platform investigative work. Nate is reluctant to use any of the funds provided by Bart Bass, but luckily, Reyna is willing to partner with him. That's awesome. Mm hmm We need to call Ben and Jerry. No, we should start our own company. Yes. This neatly solves another Gossip Girl misstep and keeps savvy, morally conscious Reyna in the story rather than exiling her back to Chicago. It also excises the messy, predatory plot involving Diana Payne. I know you don't understand, but you need to trust me. No, you know what I need to do is rethink this whole relationship. With the start of season five, Nate and Raina launch The Spectator, helped along by a few silent partners. Gossip coverage helps to pay the bills, but the paper's real work is in digging down into the dubious dealings hidden by the shine of high society. This would do way more harm than good. But it's our smoking gun. That's gonna shoot you, me, and all of our friends in the foot. As Bart Bass enters his supervillain era, Nate and Raina are quietly working on finally figuring out just what his real deal is. Rather than Chuck discovering his father's illicit business dealings, it should have been Nate. However, before he can pull together the full story, he finds the spectator sinking beneath him. No, I, I get that there's a lot of money going out the door each month, okay? But just with a little more time, I know I can turn things around. I understand, thank you. 
people let you in here. The silent partners all begin to bail, and Thorpe Enterprises is targeted with a high-profile lawsuit from out of left field, crippling the paper's finances. Nate, of course, assumes that Bart is seeking vengeance, but as he desperately tries to reach his former investors, he makes another unpleasant discovery. That his grandfather, William Vanderbilt, had been among them. Can someone please explain to me what's going on here? I mean, are you two working together? Have you been working together this whole time? This mostly carries over from the existing show where William's financial stake in Diana Payne's Spectator is the reason Nate is hired there in the first place. Their cyclical relationship throughout the series saw Nate drawn into the Vanderbilt orbit longing for family, only to be disillusioned by William's repeated attempts to manipulate him onto the suitable path. I see you got my delivery. Ah, yes I did, thank you. It's perfectly. Of course it does. It's a repeat pattern this time around as well. However, this time, William's maneuvering reveals even more sobering realities. That editorial that you published it made me realize you're the one who has an understanding of which direction the Vanderbilt family needs to go in if we're going to continue to be leaders. You see, William, too, is in cahoots with Bart Bass and wants to bring Nate back to heel. It turns out the Vanderbilts have been a beneficiary of the illegal deals Bart has been doing behind the scenes. So Bart was using the horses to hide the money he was buying illegal oil with? He had to hide it somehow. Sudan is an embargoed country. In return, William's political connections have protected Bart, and together they have formed a shadowy cabal of business contracts, government agents, and elected officials. From day one, Nate's crusade to shine a light on the seamy side of wealth and privilege has been tainted by the very forces he was rallying against, and doomed, too, since William and Bart's financial hold on the spectator would have ensured its failure no matter what. And now that Bart's wise to this guy, the question is, who will he outsmart next? But who acted as his eyes and ears on the ground in Nate's inner circle? Insert Emily in Paris, it's Dan. We watched the entire series to find out it's Dan. Yes, what a twist. It turns out that Bart bought Dan years ago. When the would-be reporter was researching his insurance fraud, Bart was researching Dan right back. Uncovering his identity as Gossip Girl and using that to hold them in a pact of mutually assured destruction. Listen, do you like hockey? Uh, sure, yeah. I was thinking maybe I could give you a business primer over a Ranger game Tuesday night. Of course, Dan's secret identity revealed a ruthless and vicious nature that Bart could respect, and so he became the emperor to Dan's Anakin Skywalker, guiding his journey through the dark side for the love of the pure mayhem it induced in Chuck's world. Unlike my son, it's nice to see someone recognizes my stature in this town. You can find a better sponsor than New York Real Estate's Man of the Year. Does this actually make more sense than the story that exists? Not really. Dan being Gossip Girl is always going to be nonsensical, but giving it some connective tissue to the shady underbelly of the show at least makes it look like it was an intentional choice and not the result of a coin toss. She could have been anywhere in the world. Like at Sarah Lawrence, where Eric Vander Woodson goes? Or maybe London, where Jenny Humphrey lives? I thought of that. All of this is a blow for sure, but inspired by all of his friends' schemes and games over the years, Nate marshals the setup of all setups. Reyna and Chuck team up to orchestrate a sham attempt at a hostile takeover, misdirecting Bart, Serena and Blair distract Dan by pretending to renew their duel for his affections, and Anne Archibald returns to finally make up for all her years as a bad mother by entrapping William. All parties manipulate their targets into big monologue moments where they confess their parts in the grand conspiracy, which are caught on hidden cameras and streamed live on the Gossip Girl platform commandeered from Dan's control. Probably by Georgina, since what wild Gossip Girl gotcha moment could go down without the Chaos Queen herself? Did you give this to anyone else? No. Oh, unless you count everybody here. It's unlikely that all the players in their vast network will be punished, but the most powerful, including Bart and William, will go down. Nate is heralded as a hero, and he accepts those laurels graciously, but frankly, he's had enough. This messy, elitist world where no one is ever what they seem to be was never his preferred scene. So with this fight behind him, he packs up his life and makes his exit from the Upper East Side. So when I graduate to a lost summer, I'm intrigued. Just spin the globe and pick a point. The future finds Nate in California, where he always hoped to be. He sleeps in, takes his dog for long walks on the beach, and spends his time with a group of people who don't know or care what his pedigree is. Doing nothing is giving me a lot of time to think, you know, and maybe the last couple of years are starting to take their toll on me. Between my family, Juliet, Reyna, you, 
I mean, sometimes I wish I could just reinvent myself. Nate hasn't totally given up on the good fight, though. He runs a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to fighting for transparency in finance and government, which is as close to political office as he wants to get. I love that guy. Can we have your autograph? <laughs> yeah. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. And as for his love life? There's an argument for Raina Thorpe, another genuinely good person, who had amazing chemistry with Nate. But given their ideological differences, maybe they decided they were better business partners than lovers. My dad and I... We're Notre Dame fans. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you can't be. What are you talking about? Uh-huh. Guess kids are out of the question. It would be more realistic if he found someone totally unrelated to his past. However, there's a part of us that delights in the idea of Nate reconnecting with someone else who often went unnoticed. Someone with the brains and drive of Blair without her vicious side. The outsider's perspective of Vanessa without the hypocrisy. The creativity of Jenny without the drama. Nelly Yuki. Top in our class, summer school at the Sorbonne. Yep, we think grown-up Dan and Nellie would be a fun, if unexpected, pairing who could balance each other well. And we can't say we don't love imagining Nate bringing her to Blair and Chuck's annual Thanksgiving dinner. Nellie was just telling me you invited her here to meet with her. I hope it is to make an official apology. That I'd love to hear. Mostly, though, Nate just enjoys living his life in a world where people don't make plans grander than where they're all meeting up to watch the sports game. Whatever else his old friends may be getting themselves into, Nate is at peace, and we love that for him. Well, in case you're wondering, my life's been pretty drama-free these days. So what do you think? Would it be better if Nate were Gossip Girl? How would you change the storyline of the sideline St. Jude's Golden Boy? Let us know in the comments. You had more fun not being you than you've ever had actually being you, which means you now know you need to change. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.